All right. Well, we've got a good group of people here. I, I think we should we should start straight away. Perhaps a few more people will come as I do my little introductory spiel. Um, and of course, just to say to everybody, this is obviously for for attendees. This this event is being recorded. Will be posted on YouTube uh, later. Um, your privacy is not being um, uh, disrupted anyway, but obviously bear that in mind when you're asking questions because those and we we will take questions at the end of the talks. So there'll be uh, three talks. We've got three great speakers for you. We have Mark Davis, who's Professor of Economic Sociology at Leeds University, Tiffany Holloman from the West Yorkshire think tank Same Skies, and Ed Straw, who is author and visiting research fellow on systems thinking at the Open University, who has for, spoken for us before on devolved government um, and is an excellent speaker. My name is Simon Duffy. I'm the Director of Citizen Network Research, which is the counterpoint to Same Skies. We're the Sheffield or South Yorkshire independent think tank. Um, I'm also President of Citizen Network Co-op, technically Citizen Network OSC, which is the Finnish word for co-op. Um, and that's a global cooperative which is working to create a world where everyone matters. Um, and one of the partners of the co-op is Opus Independence, which is the Sheffield-based media and change organisation. I don't work for Opus, but I do work very closely with them. Opus are hosting this event, but jo Joe Chris, who was going to be our facilitator, had discovered he had COVID this week, so he's a bit poorly. And so I volunteered to step in for Joe. So I'm kind of also acting as a representative of Opus and Opus will do the editing and uploading of the film after the event. Um, and they've been great supports in um, sharing the content and the marketing of the event in advance. Um, I'll run through the technical bits just as I introduce the speakers. But first of all, I just want to introduce Philip Hardstone, who is one of the founders of Democratic Yorkshire, to talk about Democratic Yorkshire and today's seminar. Philip, take it away. Uh, cheers, Simon. Um, good evening, everybody. Please forgive me looking down at my notes because. I uh, I think it's an age thing. I can I can't remember spiels as much as I used to be able to. Uh, but I'd like to start with a huge thank you uh, to all of you for joining joining us this evening. Um, I've also got some apologies. Unfortunately, uh, Simon Billcliffe uh, isn't able to join us uh, to uh, because of family commitments, uh, last minute family commitments. But uh, he sends everybody his love and regards and, and all that business. And uh, he's not ill, but he has family commitments that he has to uh, fulfil. Um, this event is being timed to coincide with um, Yorkshire Day, which of course was on Monday. Yorkshire Day is a celebration of a unified county that traditionally includes the uh, three ridings, and of course, the beautiful ancient city of York, one of my favorite cities, I must say. Indeed, we uh, support the principle of one Yorkshire ourselves. Um, we're not in favor of having bits off, uh, but keeping Yorkshire as one uh, united um, county. Uh, for us, it's not about celebrating the past, although undoubtedly uh, doing so is very important. But um, for us, it's like about looking forward uh, to the future of our beloved county. And I say, don't say the word beloved lightly. As a, a proud Yorkshireman, it is our beloved county. Uh, the future of our children, grandchildren, and of course, future generations of Yorkshire boys and girls still to be born. Now, if anybody's heard me before, they'll have heard me say that. 
and I make no apologies for it because it has to be about the future of our children, grandchildren and future generations. Otherwise, we're wasting us time. It's certainly not about old guffers like me, but it is about their future. Um, Democratic Yorkshire stands, for, stands up for the greater good of our citizens. That's all of our citizens, irrespective of whatever their background or social mobility or whatever it is that they have. We want a better future uh, for our county, a future um, as good as possible, but certainly better than that under the current government arrangements, which um, I'm afraid are, are things, and we all know this, things seem to be getting uh, much worse than they did. So democratic, <coughs> excuse me, democratic Yorkshire is not about um, changing the core of government, but it is about changing the system in which we're governed. So about the system. Uh, we have taken it upon ourselves uh, to initiate a citizen-led constitutional convention, which it is intended uh, will come up with new democratic ideas and structures for Yorkshire. And I'm hoping that some of that will come out tonight as well as we speak. Um, then the real fun begins, of course. Once we've got that structure in place, it's about campaigning to struggle for the realisation of the new kind of Yorkshire and the new kind of governance for Yorkshire. Huge tasks, I know. Uh, but we believe well worth undertaking. We see this evening's event as a part of that constitutional convention. It's about look, part of the vision that we wish to see for Yorkshire future, Yorkshire's future, and that's very important. And whatever we come up with this evening will be fed into the convention and the constitution for the new Yorkshire. Because we see that that constitution starting with a vision, what we want to achieve, and not just different clauses of government. So it is a long process, but we will make a start. Of course, your contribution is um, very important to us. So when it comes to the question time, we have some excellent speakers. Please don't be afraid to ask some awkward questions. Um, they'll answer them, not me. So please don't be afraid of asking them awkward questions. And thank you again in advance for your contribution. So now back to you, Simon, and to uh, the excellent speakers. Thanks a lot, Philip. I'll, um... So you can turn your... Oh video off as well philip if you like now um okay so everyone so we we'll run through the talks please feel free to put questions in the chat or the q a function um and i will try and make sure those questions kind of get answered and picked up at the end of the three talks um uh, but first of all i just would like to thank all the speakers and, and invite mark davis to to start um this evening's uh seminar thank you cheers simon thank you i'm just going to share uh some slides which uh along with with kind of glancing at some notes uh just like philip to my left will, will hopefully help keep me to um to time um thank you for um the invitation to join you all tonight and and hello to everyone who's um, who's listening to the webinar uh, I've been asked to speak for around 20 minutes um, and I'll be staying around later, as Simon mentioned, to answer uh, some of those awkward questions that, that you might have. Um, I'm going to focus on answering um, our broader question of what kind of future do we want for Yorkshire uh, and Yorkshire's children through looking at um, a project that I've been working on for a number of years. Um, 
which is this issue of local climate bonds. So I'm going to walk you through um, kind of what they are um, and the kind of background to that before giving a bit of an update on, on where we've got. So just to kick off, financing uh, a just and inclusive transition to a decarbonised future for Yorkshire is one of the most pressing uh, challenges that we face as a region, uh, not to mention a planet. And my research at the University of Leeds has been trying to find uh, a practical solution to that problem for uh, around a decade or more. So in the time that I have, I just want to share with you this new model of um, democratic finance that was developed in partnership with industry and the public sector uh, and to show how it's already providing uh, a direct route for cash strapped councils to raise funds for local net zero projects in our communities. Now, the wider model is known as Community Municipal Investments, or CMIs, um, but they are brought to market as local climate bonds. So I'll, I'll use those two terms kind of interchangeably, but hopefully it'll be clear as I go through. What the model does is um, allow um, local people the opportunity to vote with their money for a fairer and greener future. One that I would like to be handing over to future generations of citizens, uh, especially here in Yorkshire. Now, climate finance was one of the key goals uh, animating COP26, the UN uh, climate change talks held um, in Glasgow last November. And anyone who followed that event will know that when discussing climate finance, COP26 kind of dissolved into a dizzying set of big numbers required to meet global commitments under the Paris Agreement and uh, the recommendations of the 2021 uh, IPCC report. But financing climate action doesn't have to be something that only the big players do globally. Uh, I believe that everybody can and should get involved in supporting their own region to decarbonise. Now, on the 19th of October last year, um, just before COP26, the UK government published this document on the slide, uh, its net zero strategy, Build Back Greener, setting out national policy proposals to decarbonise all sectors of the UK economy by 2050. Whatever you may think of this government um, and the wider principle of the centralisation of political power in Westminster more generally, What's clear from reading that strategy document is that delivering the net zero public infrastructure projects necessary to meet national targets will require local government to play a leading role. Now, for me, that poses an obvious question. How effective is this devolution of responsibility to the regions without an equivalent devolution of power and resources? That is made um, all the starker by the fact that two thirds of UK councils have declared a climate emergency, yet they continue to face a significant funding crisis, uh, limiting their ability to act, even on things uh, like frontline services in health and social care, not to mention their regional uh, net zero objectives. Furthermore, since 2010, councils have on average lost 60 pence in the pound of central funding under successive government administrations. And after a decade of austerity measures across the public sector, councils have also obviously been further hit by the economic impact of COVID-19. Councils have also experienced a reduction in their borrowing options for their capital programmes. Rates for the Public Works Loan Board, or PWLB, which is the main borrowing channel for local authorities to deliver such projects, uh, have fluctuated, um, grant income has fallen, and the government finance provider, Salix, scrapped its 0% energy efficiency loan scheme in April 2021. So all of that is just to kind of set the context within which local councils are trying to deliver um, fairer and greener net zero projects for our communities and the kind of frustrations that they have in being able to do that. Now, councils will struggle to finance those projects while maintaining frontline services, therefore, without new sources of stable, low risk borrowing. And the challenge I set myself at Leeds was where might that public um, funding come from? Where might the public sector turn to secure the finance they urgently need to decarbonise their local economies? And just as significantly, how can we as citizens 
operating with agency in our regions commit to helping uh, as well as reaping the benefits of a fairer greener future for our communities and this gave uh, kind of birth to the research project that created community municipal investments so how can we find new ways of moving money so that it stays within a regional economy and helps to build the things we need right here in yorkshire when we hand over our money to a high street bank very likely the one that you've always banked with perhaps since being provided with your first savings book at school we're empowering that bank to make full responsibility for deciding where and how our money is invested and therefore what kind of outcomes that money is delivering whether they are beneficial to our community or beneficial to, to climate we often have absolutely no idea this is true for our current accounts, our savings accounts, and any investments we might be lucky to hold, a cash ISA maybe. In each case, aside from agreeing a financial rate of return to reflect the risk we're willing to take with that money, we don't really have much of a say in how our money is put to work and, and certainly not where it's invested and to whose benefit. So even in just a very small way, I want to change that and begin to tackle that bigger decarbonisation challenge at the same time. So in partnership with the crowdfunding platform Abundance Investment and the public sector organisation Local Partnerships, my research at Leeds co-created Community Municipal Investments or CMIs specifically to meet that kind of spread of challenges. CMIs use um, investment based crowdfunding as a new model of alternative finance to create an opportunity for people to invest directly into local green and social projects within their community. Crucially, um, I always say at the start, this is not a donation based model, which is often the first thing people hear when the word crowdfunding pops into a conversation. CMIs are backed by a business model that uses uh, either debt or equity structures to provide a meaningful financial return to anyone who chooses to invest. Now, in creating CMIs, we worked with six public sector case studies, uh, three in the NHS and three local authorities, which you can see here at the bottom of the slide. In, along with a range of business, uh, industry and professional services firms to ensure the technical, legal and practical implications of the model and how it would work. The thing that we heard time and again from the councils was that in order to deliver the kind of projects noted here um, within their pipeline was that any new finance model would have to meet the capital and administrative costs of their current forms of borrowing. Okay, councils just don't have the capacity to engage with new sources of, uh, of finance. And so we had to find a way of taking a lot of that burden off of them if this was going to be successful. So with council budget squeezed and precious central resources rightly protected for frontline services such as health and social care, CMIs are intended to finance uh, hard to fund net zero projects, including installing solar panels on schools and council buildings, building wind farms and EV charging points, retrofitting social housing and buildings right across the council estate um, in social housing, particularly to combat fuel poverty, uh, something that I'll come back to shortly, installing LED lighting on transport highways for buses and cycles. Now it's either strikingly brave or foolish or perhaps just the August sunshine that's um, led to my decision to introduce somebody from the wrong side of the hill at this point in an event focused on the future of Yorkshire. But I'm going to quote Andy Burnham, who has shown considerable backing to the CMI model as part of his strategy for the Greater Manchester Combined Authority. Burnham has said, the local climate bonds way of funding decarbonisation projects all over the UK will also support thousands of good green jobs, including in retrofitting our homes, moving away from fossil fuel transport and improving natural biodiversity. The newly formed uh, Greater Manchester Retrofitting Task Force will be considering innovative finance options such as these. And the nice timing of this evening's event is that earlier this week, the GMCA committed to using local climate bonds to help finance their new retrofit GM strategy. So what are CMIs as I hurtle towards the midpoint of my presentation? Uh, well, they're the model behind local climate bonds. As I mentioned, that's how, how they're brought to market. They're structured as long-term investments, so around five years with a fixed repayment. They're issued by a council corporate body via a crowdfunding platform, in this case, Abundance Investment. Um, 
and are tied to specific green or social infrastructure projects within the council uh, council area. The cost of borrowing is cheaper or equivalent for councils and certainly competitive with the PWLB, though the two can be blended for larger capital projects and I'll show how that's done um, a little bit later. LCBs also offer councils uh, an alternative to complex shareholder facing and often controversial private finance structures. So if you think of the controversy around PFI and PPP schemes, they've been shown having faced considerable public scrutiny in recent years to be infrequently aligned to climate objectives and often also the benefit of the people who are affected in the immediate community. Now, one of the major innovations of local climate bonds is to de-risk so far as possible net zero investment. And the way that we did that was through disconnecting retail investor risk from project risk. Now, what does that mean? Because I appreciate there's a lot of jargon in, in what I'm saying. The risk that investors take in moving their money into a local climate bond is that the local council will somehow cease to exist and therefore lose its tax raising power during the term of the investment, not that a particular infrastructure project fails or is delivered late. So despite the very real threats to their financial well-being, as I mentioned right at the start, local and combined authorities continue to be extremely robust organisations enjoying an institutional longevity beyond even high street banks, which even given the financial crisis, people typically continue to see as the safest place to hold their money. So it remains a fact that we've lost more high street banks since 2008 than we have local and combined authorities. Now, given that low level of risk, um, the return is around 1.2 to 2.1% on anyone who chooses to invest, roughly equivalent to UK gilt. Crucially, for ordinary investors, that level is currently providing a better rate of return on your money than most people are getting from uh, standard high street savings products. So I always check when I'm giving a presentation. Um, so this morning, um, Coventry Building Society are currently offering the best rate on any high street savings account. That's 1.8%. Um, but it's tied to a minimum deposit of £500 per month far beyond many people in our communities to be able to commit that level of monthly saving. Now, at the same time that, that things are de-risked and we're getting an equivalent or better rate of return on our money, local climate bonds also deliver more transparent social and environmental benefits by funding real, tangible net zero projects within local communities. So one of the nice things um, since beginning all of this work has been hearing from investors who now walk, cycle or catch a bus past new solar panels that have been installed on a local school, knowing that it was their money that helped to put them there, whilst at the same time receiving an equivalent or better rate of return than they were getting in their savings account or, or other aspects of their, uh, their investment portfolio if they're, if they're slightly more sophisticated with their money. Now this point at the bottom again remains really important. I mentioned that £500 a month threshold being far beyond many of the people in our communities. Well, local climate bonds are organised specifically to be socially inclusive for everyone in our community with a minimum investment threshold of just five pounds. <clears throat> and that's aligned to um, a set of principles that are part of the European uh, framework for a just transition to a greener and more democratic future. Now, this asserts that um, <clears throat> a healthy economy and a clean environment simply have to coexist. And I don't have the time to go through each of these um, principles in detail, but you can see one of the key uh, messages here is that we need to empower those who are affected by change. We need to include those members of our community who are going to be impacted either by an infrastructure project or um, by uh, feeling excluded and marginalised on financial grounds from feeling as if they can participate in greening and making our local communities fairer. So hopefully that £5 investment threshold means as many people as possible can participate in helping their community to achieve net zero um, and thus help to, to deal with a question that I hear an awful lot in my research, which is, but what can I do to help combat climate emergency? It just seems so big and so abstract and those numbers seem so vast. What can I possibly do to help? Well, we hope that local climate bonds will be one 
part of a suite of solutions where people feel that they can participate. Now, whilst the financial return on a five pound investment is clearly negligible, research shows that there are tangible co-benefits for everyone feeling as if they can participate in civic projects. And, you know, the basic principle of, of democratic involvement should should extend to, to that as well. There's a really great principle um, in the disabled people's movement, um, which says nothing about us without us. And I think that's that's a great core principle of any democratic and inclusive society. And, and as we see here, really maps well onto that that principle of empowering those who are affected by change. So all of that sounds great in in theory and on paper. What what have we actually done? So um, I'll just finish by offering a update on what local climate bonds have achieved so far and 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 what the next steps involve. So the UK's first two local climate bonds were issued in the summer of 2020 in two very different socio-economic and political contexts. The first by the Conservative-led West Berkshire Council in the relatively wealthy and rural southeast of England, <clears throat> and the second by the Labour-led uh, Warrington Borough Council in the relatively poorer and, and more urban northwest of England. Now, both bonds were offered at 1.2% over five years, and each was sufficiently attractive, even within the context of 2020 and the economic uncertainty of COVID-19, to manage to raise £1 million each to support local net zero projects. Now, in West Berkshire, the funds were used to support the installation of a number of projects within the Council's uh, environment strategy, including rooftop solar, improvements to cycleways, the installation of LED lighting and flood defence projects across the community. In Warrington, the funds were helped uh, to, to, to develop two large ground mounted solar farms and a 27 megawatt um, battery storage facility. And that was in partnership with, with GridServ. So this was a case of where the local climate bond was blended with the PWLB and, and some other streams of finance in order to deliver something on that scale. What's great about the Warrington project is that as part of their wider green energy strategy, the council will use electricity and revenues generated by that solar farm to accelerate other green projects within the community, including um, measures to reduce fuel poverty, a serious and an increasingly urgent challenge given the wider cost of living and energy crises that we're all facing this winter. Now, those two um, launches demonstrated that the model can also offer councils new ways of communicating with residents about a shared public mission to combat something like climate breakdown, building or rebuilding relationships of trust with local people through engaging in supporting local initiatives. Now, that matters, I think, because it's still the case um, that only 10 percent of local people know that their council has even declared a climate emergency. So when you're dealing with that level of engagement, anything that can boost community involvement um, and increase participation, I think is to be welcomed. Furthermore, on, on the point about rebuilding relationships of trust, we actually saw that in action when one in six investors in the West Berkshire climate bond chose to donate their very first interest payment back to the council to support a rewilding project. So something like rewilding is not revenue generating, so you can't really create a margin um, to tie that to, to the bond, um, the suite of projects. But through um, getting the interest back as a donation, um, one in six people felt that they trusted the council enough to, um, to do that. And at the very start of our research process, the idea of, of anyone in our focus groups choosing to donate money to their local council was completely alien and not very likely. So to have, have moved the needle so far within just two years um, seems like quite a, quite a shift. West Berkshire Council won silver in the Green Public Service Awards and also took the Sustainability and Social Value Award at the SIP for Public Finance event specifically for their local climate initiative. And although I don't have time to read through, you can see at the bottom here, uh, Joseph Holmes from West Berkshire Council was, um, was very pleased with the outcome. Um, and that the council are now considering when they will launch their second uh, second CMI. So just to close, um, on the back of this initial success, the, the CMI model that stands behind local climate bonds has now secured the support of the, the UK's Green Finance Institute, 
who launched a national campaign targeting all 404 unitary authorities in the UK to pledge to launch an LCB in the two years following COP26. As I speak to you this evening, uh, four more councils have already launched, Islington and Camden, both raised a million pound each, and Cotswold and Telford and Reckin are currently live and are closing in on their £500,000 targets. And a further four councils, Westminster, um, Eastbourne, Lewis and Blenny Gwent, um, have each pledged to launch within the next few months, which will take us to our first 10 councils um, who have offered a CMI. And the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that we are yet to have our first Yorkshire local climate bond despite the fact that Leeds City Council in particular were, were one of the original case studies in, in the research. So I'm currently working incredibly hard to make sure that we land uh, a Yorkshire Council with this initiative soon, um, ideally before Manchester do it. Now all the hurdles that were put in front of us um, in the research project have been jumped. Will the model work for councils? Will people choose to invest their money? And will people be motivated enough by place to, to tie their money to projects in their local community. And I think it's definitely the case that that has happened. So as someone who was born in Bradford and now works in Leeds, I hold both a personal and a professional hope that the County of Yorkshire will soon benefit directly from CMIs that were created here in Yorkshire uh, in the same way as, as other areas of the country and that we'll start to see LCBs rolling out across the region. Just as a closing thought, only by democratising finance in this way, by empowering more people to make better, more sustainable financial decisions, can we truly hope to build a fairer, greener economy for Yorkshire's children? I'll leave it there and hand back to Simon. But thanks for listening. That was excellent, Mark. Really interesting. And as a proud citizen of Sheffield, I also am wondering why my council has declared a climate emergency twice, hasn't yet managed to organise such a thing. So things to follow up on. But before we go down that, not rabbit hole, but whatever the opposite of a rabbit hole is, uh, that very fertile ground, um, I want to hand over to our next speaker, who I'm equally looking forward to hearing, which is Tiffany Holloman from Same Skies. Tiffany, over to you. Hello. Um, how am I going to follow up Mark? You were absolutely brilliant. I am Dr. Tiffany R. Holloman. I am co-founder and co-director of Same Skies and also project manager at the University of Bradford. I am a historian and sociologist by trade. So what I'm going to speak of will actually take us back in time a bit, but I'm gonna to get to today's contemporary meaning if if you just follow the journey along with me. Philip, I'm going to say that is not just an old person as I am going to definitely read from my notes to make sure that I stay on task and within the time allotted. So please don't feel bad. Okay, so everything that I'm gonna talk about is going to stem from a book called Uneven Redevelopment. It was written in 1988. Actually, it's an edited version by Massey and Allen. But near the introduction, they state that there is a relation between changes in the organization of the economy and changes in its, in its geography. And very much what is happening or has happened, whether we know it or not, is that uh, the way we commerce, our economics, our future is very much derived from our geography and how we treat our geography and what our geography allows us to have. Okay, so how does this stem into our history? Our ancestors' commerce derived from the timber industry. Their ability to survive and thrive hinged on the skills to be able to hunt and gather. No one probably can dispute that. Moving along the path through to modernity, their livelihoods changed from 
an agrarian society to one of manufacturing. One of my great grandparents, a little bit of my grandparents, some of you, Fordism all the way. This evolution is most, something most of us are aware of, but our problem is, is what is next? As manufacturing has given way to automation, automation now has given way to services and now the self-services. We are faced with what to do with how we are going to live in the future. The self-service industry of functions have actually disrupted centralized services. And so what are we left to, how are we left to make a living as everything else becomes very much automated? The way we have partitioned our land masses and our bodies of water isn't sustainable with our current home inflation currency devaluation world because that's exactly what we're living in. Some call it capitalism, some call it neo-capitalism, but at the basis is again, home inflation at the same time of currency devaluation. Because of our abuse of natural resources and more importantly, our fickle solutions, we are left with the sharp reality that chaos can be more clearly envisaged than peace. I can sit here with all of you this evening and I can clearly envision a scramble for drinking water. I can clearly see an expansion of tent cities and makeshift home and rough sleeping, things right out of 1984 Orwell. And I can clearly also see the continuation of the manipulation of public perception by inheritors of many in power today. It's been going on and I can, again, I can clearly see this. The reason why I don't see an abundance of financial freedom of human fellowship in mass or most countries at the top of the human developmental index, which actually exists, is because it's just, it's not witnessed today. There is a saying that we use often in education that, that you can't be what you can't see. And I think that is one of the cruxes of how we develop a future of West Yorkshire, or, I'm sorry, of all of Yorkshire, as a matter of fact, is how do we start being now so that our children can see now? This is something that same skies try to tackle. I say all of this to say that the future of West Yorkshire starts now from events like today, where we are there to configure completely new ways of trading but also new commerce like the bonds Mark mentioned, but also new currencies like crypto. I can, I can see a path forward to where there's already an existence where people are earning funds by using digital currency as pedometers. It's a currency called step where you, every time you walk, you earn something. There is a, a, a company called PaveGen, which actually has a few, I, I think they have several places throughout the UK where you step on this new type of asphalt and it produces energy. And so can you imagine having that down a high street where the shopkeepers do not have to pay energy because of just the traffic flow? These types of things, exist but again they're not readily seen and i feel like as far as same skies is concerned is one of our jobs is to amplify these things so that again we can be what we can see 
um, another thing that while I see these new ways of interacting and these new commerces, I also see that we can learn from our past. There is nothing wrong with the barter and trade system. As a matter of fact, when COVID hit and a lot of homes were deficient in their technology to be able to cope with work and learning and schools, a lot of people, they came together and did digital swamps just so that everyone could have on an even ground, could be on an even ground. These types of things, it shouldn't just be an anomaly because of a pandemic, but we should all be able to maneuver in this world by these types of ways of trading. And again, it's reaching back to our past, but again, it's efficient and it will, it's something that we can incorporate now so that our children can see that they can do this too. Before I leave um, my spiel tonight, I will just say that the same skies tries to tackle concerns of Yorkshire's economic commerce by highlighting our similarities as a group of people more than our differences. Biologically, we are all 99% or 98% the same. And if we can continue to focus on that, we, there should be no doubt that we can do much better in securing the livelihoods and the quality of life of everyone within our counties, because after all, we do all share the same skies. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions later. That was brilliant and very thought-provoking way of asking the, thinking about the future through the past, Tiffany. Thank you so much. And lastly, going to our last speaker, Ed Straw. Ed, who we've been happy, very lucky to hear from in the past, very thought-provoking speaker. Um, but now, perhaps with a more economic focus, Ed, so I look okay. forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks, Ed. Okay. Um, well, building on uh, what Mark has said uh, and his talk in terms of what's happening now, and Tiffany's talk in terms of the, the developments uh, around then, I want to cover how Yorkshire, the, the political economy that Yorkshire could have in the future once it's got hold of uh, uh, its own destiny, essentially through Yorkshire Parliament or however that's configured. Um, political economy, so basically the economy occurs because of the politics that lead to the setting of the rules, hence the term political economy. Um, and I wanted to start um, by reading a piece out of uh, a recent 4th of August uh, London Review of Books on a book uh, about fraud in uh, very big companies in Germany, actually. But I thought the opening was spot on. People talk about capitalism as if it were just one thing. But the truth is that we live in a global city system of capitalism's plural, with a chunk of ideology in common, but considerable differences in local evidence emphasis. There are 50 shades of capitalism. Britain has fantasies about itself as an ideologically clear-minded capitalist state, but our political economy is riddled with padding and feather bedding and cronyism and inefficiencies Perhaps the most spectacular example being the 15.7 billion plus pounds lost in fraud and error during the COVID response. An outrageous failure that in a well-functioning society would be guaranteed to bring down the government and trigger reform of the treasury and procurement systems. Instead, the person at the head of the machinery which supervised or failed to supervise the fraud apocalypse is currently in a runoff to be the next prime minister. Now, there's a couple of, I mean, other than that being, I think, a really good piece, uh, a couple of points. Yeah, capitalism has many, many shades and this notion that we're fed that actually, well, 
you know, it is it. There is only one, and it's neoliberal and ultra, and the thing we've got, well, that's complete and utter nonsense, and has always been complete and utter nonsense. The second point I wanted to make in relation to that piece is that, if you like, that's the competition, Yorkshire. You know, can we do better than that? Well, uh, I certainly hope so. So if we're thinking about how things would work with uh, a Yorkshire par Parliament, and, and what that would mean as we go through all of the system that comprises the whole of Yorkshire, I thought I'd start with potholes. Um, potholes are something that uh, uh, we all experience and um, they're a uh, nuisance. Now, you know, if you wanted to have the ideal system for fixing potholes, what would it be? Well, what's the purpose? Well, I thought the purpose we should uh, state as FFF, firm fast fixing. Okay, so, you know, that's what we want. Now, how would that happen? So, first of all, you know, how does the need become known? Can the public tell the fixers direct? Um, how do we select the method of repair using my knowledge and feedback? And then how do the people doing the work operate, perhaps through a self-directed team? So if you think about that, well, then ideally this has to be a local function, not centralised. The, the, the doers are as closely connected to those affected, the road users, maybe even neighbours, so that the sense of responsibility of the doers is high. They are serving the community of which they are part. Lines of communication are short. We can see happy people able to simply report a problem, talk to a real human being and see it fixed. Well, my word. Now, in order to facilitate that, local government would need to have significant revenue raising powers. So the community itself can decide just how much to spend on potholes versus the many other things. And we would like happy local government officers able to raise money directly, free of central government control, but with effective management accountability and, and how that is constructed, but having a strong feedback scrutiny function. And you don't want the ideology, so it's all through proportional representation. And finally, workers properly employed, i.e. they're not gig and they're not cushy and pay differentials are compressed we've got happy workers now there, there's one way local as local as reasonable and possible that could be organized and could and would be organized through a yorkshire parliament and and the layers of local government underneath it what happens now typically well um there's there's this damn great sort of vacuum cleaner that roves around the country and every possible institution, hoovering up the money. So uh, typically, uh, pothole fixing uh, would be contracted out, um, possibly to a local contractor, but that local contractor, and I've seen three or four tiers of this, would be subcontracting to subcontracting, subcontracting, and you'd find one of these big outsourcing companies that's quoted on the stock exchange, that's then therefore part of the global monetary system. And what does the global monetary system want? Does it want fast firm fixing? Uh, it hasn't got a clue, it doesn't matter, so long as the money's coming up and that money will be coming up to two sets of people, particularly one, uh, the senior management and their bonuses and all the rest of it, and the second is uh, to the markets themselves, where uh, people like um, Jacob Rees-Mogg will be very pleased that the market has expanded further so that there is more money uh, to be made. But in terms of that system having any interest in getting this stuff done locally and well, A, B, any interest in uh, the lives uh, and uh, futures of the workers involved, any interest in 
whether actually the potholes get fixed or not. That doesn't matter as long as we make a profit and we can uh, spin and scam uh, the answers and throw in a part of corporate speak to pretend that it does. Um, it's uh, a really awful system, and you and you'll find this this Hoover, and it you may have found it sort of hovering over yourself, sucking the money out of you in a university, for example, um, or anywhere else. So that's why, uh, in taking that particular example, but then spreading it across um, to all of the functions. Uh, within Yorkshire. That, that's why this is not just about um, having control, but it feeds, all of that feeds into the political economy and the way people can live. Now, um, you then look around the world and say, well, again, if we look forward, none of what I'm talking about, incidentally, I should say, is any way speculative. Um, what we're talking about is doing things that are quite common in the rest of the world. I mean, that's, you know, it's the UK, which is completely out of order, uh, not the other way around. Um, I was speaking to a friend who's a professor of um, urban planning at uh, UCL, and he was uh, telling me about Bill Bauer in uh, northern Spain. And this was uh, a dump in the 1980s. But in Spain, a uh, regional government has uh, considerable powers to raise money locally. So they, they don't, I mean, what Mark was describing is absolutely brilliant, but, but actually they can raise significant money. And there's, there's a table somewhere or other which shows how much uh, in each city around the world uh, that city can raise in taxation and keep and decide how it's going to spend it itself. So typically in Spain, I think it's 50% of taxes are collected nationally, 50% of taxes collected locally. Um, I think the uh, example he gave to me of the taxes collected locally, they give a portion to uh, Madrid, to central government, I think that's for redistribution, but don't quote me on that. And then they get on and they have a proper chunk of money within a functioning and effective, accountable system of government to then make decisions. So what did they decide to do? Well, there's always this conundrum between, on the one hand, do you reduce business taxes to attract business in the short term? Or do you increase taxes and reinvest that in the local economy to produce uh, a, a return in the long term? Well, Bilbao decided to use tax increases to clean up the river, open up the waterfront. They bid successfully for the Guggenheim Museum and they built a metro and they tarted up the city centre. Um, but by the way, I mean, just compare that to the hoops that Manchester had to go through to get the Treasury to agree to the tram. In terms of uh, Bilbao, it was transformed, investment flowed in, the tax base increased, and they could service the loans and repay them. Uh, and I mean, the key here is A, having that control, but B, uh, having quality decision making. Uh, and, and if you don't have both, uh, well, sorry, let's put it the other way around. You need both in order to get that right. Um, you can look at all sorts of different areas uh, around the world in terms of how um, local cities, local regions have done extraordinary things. I may have mentioned Med Medellin, uh, if that's a correct pronunciation, previously uh, in Colombia. Um, it used to be uh, the centre, the absolute centre of the uh, cocaine trade. Um, Pablo Escobar was the name of the person who ran that uh, ruthlessly, horribly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, drug warfare continuous. In 20 years, that city now appears on uh, tourist brochures as a great place to go. 
So, so what the hell happened? Well, they had an executive mayor. Incidentally, I, I know I had a comment last time about people not liking executive mayors. I'm not talking about uh, British style executive mayors, uh, that some of them very good, extremely limited powers. I'm talking about proper executive mayors with proper accountability, uh, proper funding, proper controls over that funding and so on. Um, so what did he decide to do? Well, one of the interesting things that he decided to do was to, rather than put all the investment into the centre of Medellin, he put the investment into the poor areas. Uh, particularly, he built um, like a ski lift. Uh, there's a proper name, isn't there? You know, these, these uh, buses, as it were, going up on wires to the poor areas and connected the poor areas to the rich areas in the city centre, People then went up there and he also put uh, attractions and so on up there for reasons for going. Uh, and then equally, the poor, poorer people could come down and work in the areas. And that uh, seems to have been one of the principal differences. I think we've talked about Preston before. Uh, then you can decide that actually within the local economy, you can use local procurement rules to decide who you're going to hire locally. And uh, they have uh, been very successful in building the strength of uh, all sorts of local suppliers, um, uh, food, um, uh, well, just about anything that you can imagine a local authority want wanting. Um, so that's the first point, I think, in terms of what you need is local uh, decision-making and local powers. You also then need, as I said, local tax raising powers. I mean, I think we've talked about those. And then finally, to really build uh, on what Mark has said and Tiffany, um, you need the local monetary system. Now, not the global monetary system. <laughs> That's here to suck money away from you. You want the local monetary system, which is here for people locally to decide how they'd like best to use their money. It's not been hidden away. Um, <clears throat> some of the most obvious examples of those, savage, savings and mortgages um, through building societies. So, you know, Leeds Building Society, there was a Halifax Building Society. It was demutualized and turned into a bank. Um, uh, and now all of that money goes off to the global monetary system. Um, the uh, classic example on all of this, which I appreciate is a bit outside Yorkshire, but Northern Rock. Northern Rock was uh, uh, on the demutualization path. Uh, Labour got in in 1997. Um, regrettably, they didn't at that moment go, hang on, uh, this is not a good idea and sort of turn it off. Northern Rock did demutualize and was actually the first major financial institution to uh, go bust. Uh, it, it of itself didn't trigger the financial collapse because that was going to happen anyway, but it was the first major one. So, so we don't want any of that. Um, we want uh, savings and, mutual, and mortgages held uh, in building societies that act responsibly and, if you like, owe their existence to uh, uh, people locally. Pensions and insurance. There used to be any number of particularly Scottish mutual pensions and insurance organisations, the same basis, no shareholders. So we, we don't have any shareholders to feed. We don't have a pile of marketing to feed. We don't have a pile of overpaid managers to feed. Um, so the money is retained within uh, the mutual society. And those mutual societies for pensions and insurance uh, would need to be largely restarted. This isn't just a point about keeping money within uh, a particular area, and in this case, Yorkshire. If you look at the returns that you get out of sending your money off to uh, some pension provider in the city of London against the collective returns that you can get from mutuals, then you're talking about as much as a 50% difference 
So potentially you will get a 50% better pension out of these arrangements as well, which obviously in itself then feeds uh, the political economy that we're, um, we're talking about here. You need uh, regional banks. Um, and well, you might say, well, why do you need regional banks? Well, I think exactly as has been explained earlier on, uh, a national bank is, is it particularly interested in, in some local but significant business um, in rural Yorkshire that's trying to do X or Y or Z or in, or in a city? It's so distant. I mean, will it have the knowledge? Well, no, we, and, and do we have the controls? You need regional banks because regional banks, as with regional government, can see so much better, A, what is needed, and B, the opportunities that they're there to do, that are there to do um, creative things. Um, regional banks also, um, okay, I've got my couple of minutes, a uh, couple of minutes, I shall stop very shortly, Simon. Um, Regional banks uh, also um, don't have to issue shares. I mean, if you take New Zealand, which, which is actually not so different in population size from, you, from Yorkshire, you take New Zealand, there is very little equity shareholder funding going on there. It's by and large all through debt, which is a much more stable way of doing it. Um, so to finish off, um, we've got choices. There are all sorts of choices. You've got choices. There are 50 shades of capitalism, including mutual capitalism. Um, we do, I think, have more power than those in power allow us to think we have. And the, and the examples from Tiffany and Mark earlier on, I think, you know, I can almost see a sort of voluntary council tax coming in where we're saying, look, for Christ's sake, this is nonsense funding councils at this level. We need to up it. But we do have uh, more power than is obvious. And I think the other thing that strikes me so much is the need it's almost to take two fingers to the Westminster Whitehall thing and to say, no, we're going to do this differently. So on that note, I rest my case. Thank you very much. Brilliant, Ed. Brilliant. Fifty Shades of Capitalism is, is both an attractive and unattractive phrase all at once, isn't it, I think? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Mark and Tiffany, if you could uh, turn your cameras on as well. And um, let's see. I don't think anybody's dared to ask a question yet unless I've missed it. So, But I have questions, so I might just kick us off a little bit. And uh, But I mean, it's, I think that was fascinating because we had, you know, um, that Ed was talking in a sense about the, the multiple different institutional arrangements in the sense of the political economy and the different ways we could imagine it and and Tiffany kind of gave us a historical way of reimagining and there was Mark's very concrete and helpful example was also just imagining the the different relationship we can achieve now which connects back to what Ed was saying between citizens and our existing local institutions despite the constraints despite the uh, hyper centralization of the UK and the kind of colonial internal colonial history that we've seen play out in inside the UK. So I suppose what I was thinking is would be useful for and you might each want to just almost reflect back on the the other things that you've heard but is is just to get a sense for the audience of maybe where where the hope is. So one of the things Ed ended on which I think is a, a good good starting point for us is well what can we do now in this very very broken situation after decades of nonsense talk about devolution and and then austerity layered on top of that well what could we do now um and so i'm going to ask maybe mark to begin with i mean in a way mark you've explained the a really exciting example of something that addresses a really urgent issue of our times the climate crisis um but how do we make this, in a sense, a more participative, more collaborative, more social campaign, in a way, for changing our relationship? You know, I, I, I can't just sit and wait for Sheffield Council to wake up, can I? There must be 
other things we can do collectively about this? What do you think? Yeah, thanks, Simon. Uh, and thanks, Tiffany and Ed, as well. It's really, really interesting to kind of see points of, of kind of connection and, and overlap um, in, in what each of you were saying. I mean, I mean, I'm, so I'm an economic sociologist, so I necessarily see agency in economic terms, um, not to the exclusion of, of politics and, and wider social movements. Some of the examples that Ed was talking about um, and that Tiffany and I have talked about before around crypto, local currencies, etc., are all examples of how people can kind of organize themselves into different kinds of um, relations of exchange, really. I won't I won't just say money, but you know, Tiffany was talking about how the pandemic gave us the opportunity to kind of rediscover ways of exchanging goods and services and favors and also rediscovering gifting as a mechanism through which we're able to provide what we and our families and our communities need and that the way in which that you know over time taking that historical perspective have been somewhat captured by different varieties of capitalism i think ed's absolutely right in terms of you know there's there's not just one model of capitalism at work here that money is hoovered up by all different systems in all different contexts so the, the way i'll answer the question just just for now is you know where where did local climate bonds come from and you know by necessity the way of explaining them is, is to put the citizen at the center and, and get them to face their council and get them to face the climate emergency and to think about how we can build networks that allow us to operate within existing structures given the urgency of the climate timelines we have in order to deliver the outcomes that we need locally but the broader you know kind of um theory or, or kind of philosophy behind them was actually to take the citizen in 2008 and ask them to face the banking system and to get them to say why is it after banks habitually topped every single poll from 2008 onwards as the least trusted organization within society do we continue to give the one object we hold that we know is the material embodiment of agency which is our money to the institutions that drove those disastrous outcomes and by getting citizens to think about their money differently in the same way that we've sensitized people to their shopping very often we're far more sensitive now about where our our clothes come from where our food comes from we want to know the supply chains we want to know the ethical working practices people get fair pay all of those kind of sensitivities that might shape the way in which we shop and move through our high street I'd like to see as applied to who we bank with. And when you think of the, the panoply of options that Ed was outlining there around regional banks, building societies, um, credit unions, um, you know, you, Ed mentioned Lee's Building Society. They, they announced either earlier this week or late last week that they're going to stop offering mortgages on second homes because they've seen the kind of, you know, that that's a, a potentially really problematic um, issue for, for housing within um, communities and they want to try and try and do what they can to arrest that so that to me is a key pressure point if we withdraw our money from circulating within the usual financial channels where it's handed over to a high street bank and it, it fizzes off into these international networks through the city of london and we have no idea what kinds of outcomes it's driving the more mechanisms we can find to keep that money locally not just in a kind of parochial regional sense, but actually to support projects within our communities, the more agency I think we'll realize that we have. Uh, and we're handing over so much responsibility and agency through the way we, we manage our money at the moment that I think that's a, a really simple first step to getting people to recognize the agency that they have beyond just getting involved in, in civil society groups and lobbying MPs and drive, trying to drive, you know, kind of systemic change. Think about who you bank with. Think about what they're doing with your money and, and ask yourself if you're happy with that. That's very powerful, Mark. And um, just I would say from Citizen Network's point of view, we'd love to hear more about that and help amplify that message, I think. Tiffany, what I mean, from from the same Sky's point of view, maybe you Maybe you could contextualize for the audience also a little bit about Same Skies and the and the things you've been doing. 
to grow this sense of imagination of what is possible and what brings us together. I mean, so beautiful must be the think tank with the most beautiful name, I think, in the world. So um, what's your sense of the the path for change and the role of Same Skies maybe in this? Uh, thank you. Um, for Same Skies, this actually it touches on what Mark said towards the end, is the amplification of voices. And the region is just, to be honest, is so few voices at the top. And there's so many other people who they feel that they don't have a space at the table or they don't deserve a space or it's just reserved for the best and brightest. And part of Same Skies' mission is to say, no, you are the expert of your neighborhood. You know where the potholes exist that Ed talk about. You know these things. You know how many high street shops have closed within the past five years. So you are the expert in using that and channeling that to say that, I think this is how my town, city, region should move forward. And so what Same Skies, what, as a matter of fact, our next steps is to, I don't wanna say to create a citizens assemblies like they like before, but to maybe do a, revamped version of that where we have hubs all over the region where people come and discuss issues within their postcodes and they feed them to the local council and actually are adamant about these changes because it's very hard to reject or to face people when they're coming to you with their problems and so part of same skies is to work around getting that done. And so we start small. We have, of course, we have the manifesto. If you all haven't read it, please go to our website. But also we do small things like our West Yorkshire walks, which might seem small, but what it does is empower local people to embrace that they are the expert of their neighborhood and to take others around and say, this is a great tea shop. This is a great pub, you know, and so people have other places to go and they can actually see themselves in these spaces and feel comfortable and actually know that they exist, which is feeding, again, our local economy. And it's, again, it brings me back to showing how much we are all alike. The pool of money, as when I, when I was lecturing, and I was demonstrating to the students, the proletariat, they could not believe how many people fit into that boat, you know, thinking that if you had a certain label, if you was a solicitor or a GP that you weren't in the proletariat. And I'm like, yes, they're still in the boat. Everyone is still struggling. They're there just like the janitor. And if we can focus on, again, how much power we have, and that's something Ed mentioned that we, we really just don't know how powerful we are. And part of Same Skies' mission is to let them know, yes, you are powerful. You should be heard. You only have one life. This is your space. And let's make it better. I hope that answered your question, Simon. That's lovely. No, no, that's a very uh, a fantastic set of images and examples. So, Ed, I'm going to ask you a question maybe like so in a way you you're presenting which you and i have talked about these things before so we're both very aware of the kind of extreme irrationality of the uk state and the extreme centralization but as you say it's not it's not that obvious in a sense is it to people f where the news filtered in the way it is and and just education the way it works in this country so i wondered whether you um you know, looking back over and you and you've been very involved, you've you've been right at the heart of the beast a little bit as well. So looking at it from the point of view of democratic Yorkshire and our on our attempts to try and see if we can shift the balance or find a fracture. What are some of the strat strategies you'd maybe recommend back to us in Yorkshire about what we might do to to topple this thing in a different direction to get to get the get this crazy train off the crazy tracks it's on this might sound a bit obtuse um but and i may have mentioned this before but but we are what we read 
Um, and uh, a very good friend uh, was having um, uh, an argument with his son. Um, his son, age 20 odd, uh, is into um, uh, blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies and all the rest of it. And also um, quite persuaded or, or by, by um, the wild conspiracy theories as distinct from the real ones. And uh, his son is saying, look, you know, read something different, or consume something different. Now, uh, the friend said, well, look, you know, I, 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 he, he, what did he mention? The BBC, uh, Channel 4 and The Guardian as, as, as um, you know, legitimate and, and authentic sources of news. Well, you know, we're the best one in the world. I don't regard them as such. I mean, you know, the BBC is actually a semi-government controlled news service. You know, and, and you, you've got, it's not Andrew Marr anymore, is it? But whoever it is, I mean, he is grilling. Well, I saw this with Paxman. He's grilling a prime minister and he's got half an eye behind it because uh, who pays his salary? Well, it comes from the licence fee. Who sets the licence fee? Well, it's set by the government in practice. And so the BBC is sort of looking over its shoulder and moderating and bringing to the middle and it's got this crazy impartiality thing. Channel 4, yeah, generally, but the frame of tradition of understanding of the people that run and, and talk and edit and report in Channel 4 is really very, very narrow if you look at their backgrounds. No criticism of them per se, but part of the problem of the um, uh, London establishment and elite is, is yeah, the, the, the very narrow base. I mean, it does go slightly beyond you know, Oxford University and a PPE, but, you know, not that far, actually, if you look at all the possible things that there are to understand in the world. So um, I get the conversation, which is uh, a, a sort of an academic-based news service, which um, takes a bit of a longer view. And that's the first thing I turn to in the morning. You know, I, I don't read uh, the, the mainstream press or I certainly would never listen to the Today programme. It's just awful. Um, and I don't watch the news. So here's the conversation. Um, I get the feed from The Economist. I get the feed from The Financial Times. Only the feed, not the thorough stuff. I get some stuff from the States around. So a whole collection of stuff. Step one, please change what you read <laughs> because then you will start to see the world in a different way i mean beyond beyond that i think a lot of the you know what is politics politics is talking to people and which is what we're doing now and we're trying to persuade people of different things and and and, and to act in different ways and to take action in different ways Keep talking, uh, uh, keep persuading, keep pushing, keep arguing. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. Am I running out of steam, Simon? Oh, I thought that was a. I think change what you read is a very good place to start. That was a good uh, uh, prompt to us, isn't it? I mean, that is the. Uh, uh, and in a way, again, we. We. I think there is a challenge around challenging what's counted as normal, what's counted as yeah. mainstream, isn't there? Yeah. I mean, I, I feel very much the same as you, but I know that I, I bump up against my friends and people who are not, and they just think that's weird. Yeah. <laughs> so um, somehow making those things seem natural may be part of our challenge. And then we, we, we've got a little bit of time left. And um, Andy Walker, I, I think Mark's answering some of this online, but Andy's walked, asked a couple of specific questions about the um the climate bonds um and the relationship to local authority and also the way in which um i suppose we feel i mean in a sense i feel like mark's story tells us that people do feel commitment to these things but andy's got a suggestion about that Anne has asked a question about your each of your specific uh, views on the donor economics model which if people aren't familiar with that 
is basically a way of getting people to think about economic growth in a much more thoughtful way to relate, um, to think about the bounds of growth and what's actually, what can we afford in terms of the economy, the climate, the ecology. Um, so anyway, I, I'm not doing a very good job of explaining that. Um, but I, I'll let you each have a little think about that because I suppose that's another broad question, isn't it? And there have been other questions. I mean, famously, well, it's not JFK, it was Robert Kennedy, wasn't it, talking about GDP as a poor measure of economics. And yet we have we have these great names saying these things. And yet day after day after day, the model of the economy carries on being how much money is being spent. We don't actually care what it's spent on. Um, and the last question from Andrew, sorry, I've only just picked this up. Is there anything we could be used to do? Um, yeah, so as are, are there specific strategies that we could take, Andrew's asking, particularly around the climate bond, which again, I would be very interested in picking up practically after the event. So uh, I'm mindful, of, we, we're definitely going to finish at eight. And I, and I want to give Philip a moment to close and thank. So maybe a kind of... Um, I'm sorry for squeezing it in at this last moment because the questions just really came in at the end, but maybe around each of you giving your like one or two minutes overview to some of those questions. Really, I know that's not a bit fair, but if you could, Mark, maybe just pick up some. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you for the question. So uh, I've dropped a response to Andy's first question just to say that, um, yeah, local climate bonds came out about kind of after climate emergency strategies were were, were declared and, and a kind of frustration really that councils were facing all of these barriers that they they knew what they needed to do locally around climate but they they were in a financial context and a social context really where that wasn't possible so in part LCBs are a kind of response to try to to get some of that work moving um on Andy's second question about um I mean, yeah, quite, <laughs> but it comes to the integrity of the financial system. Um, but yeah, in terms of how safe they are, I mean, one of the reasons for working with Abundance Investment is that the um, they're the only regulated crowdfunding platform in the UK, um, which offers a, a degree of protection. Again, de-risking the investment so that investors take council risk, not project risk. So yeah, the council underwrites um, underwrites that investment to make sure that your you know your money is protected in that way. So again, that's a further level of of protection. Um, and whether yeah, whether they're branded specifically around Yorkshire, I mean that's a combined authority decision. Um, but certainly um, you know around um, the idea of local councils badging them for for particular areas uh, has been key, particularly at town and district council level actually. A sense that we don't want this doing at Leeds or Sheffield. We we quite like Wakefield or Halifax or someone to kind of get involved at that level. Kirk Lees, for example. So um, very quickly on 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 Kate Raworth's work. Um, I think the donut model is fantastic as a model. Um, I think it's it you know it's asking Bobby Kennedy's question in a different way. So I think that's incredibly useful. You probably picked up. I'm quite practically minded in this space, so I want to know how that works. Um, and I think the donut model has been quite challenging to implement practically. Um, some of the best examples are at city scale. So if you look at uh, Amsterdam, for example, announced um, that it was part of the deal network. Um, Amsterdam now has its own metrics for deciding how it's going to procure and, and improve um, different parts of the, the city. So there are examples of this working in practice. And I think there's there's lessons to be learned there. Just picking up on on Tiffany's point, um, you know, around there's far more where we're similar than different and, and actually just going for a walk with people can be can be a great first step. Um, if you'll excuse the pun, the 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 idea that, you know, getting to know your donor is the most important first step you can make. What is there or what is being provided locally that you might not already be aware of? Um, and then, Andrew, yeah, just finally, a template letter would be fantastic. And maybe something Simon and I and, and Philip could, could kind of have a conversation about afterwards. I feel slightly. Um, uncomfortable if that comes from me having done the research it seems a little self-serving in a way to start writing to councils and asking them to do this but certainly i'd be happy to be a co-signatory if, if anyone felt that this was something just to ask their councils to look at um and to do their own evaluation that would yeah that would certainly help get things moving in in yorkshire in particular i think would be fantastic so yeah thank you for that
Thanks, Mark. That was a great job sweeping things up together. Thank you. <laughs> Tiffany, what would you like to say to end? Um, to Andy, I'm going to say, I'm going to just say Mark handled those beautifully <laughs> to Andy and Andrew. Um, for Anne, I would say very similar to what Mark said as far as it's, it's, I love the idea of the donut model, but implementation to me is going to be siloed before it is actually a joined organic piece. And I say that because education is working on it. So money is being pumped because of, because of Brexit and because of the economy. I'm noticing that in education, we're now getting funds to find our local talent to bring them up, to bring up our local cities, cities, something I think universities should be doing in the first place. They, they should be handling local issues and local problems. And now because of the lack of international funds, we have to you know, bring in our local talent. And by doing so, what is happening as a result is we are like at Bradford where I work, we're having a, a garden where you can come and pick herbs and everyone can plant something you know things like that which feeds into the donut model but it's not wide enough yet and so just like the Amsterdam example is siloed but we're getting there just to let you know and we're getting there it's just again in theory it's beautiful it's the practicalities that are the issue thanks Tiffany yes brilliant Ed and the clock is ticking yeah, um, well, I, I, uh, like uh, Tiffany, I think Mark said it, he's answered everything uh, as fine. The the only uh, thing, uh, I mean, just a, yeah, the Fukushima nuclear disaster, it increased GDP. Yeah, discuss. Uh, well, how about, you know, <laughs> energy prices through the roof, oil companies' profits through the roof. Has anyone seen anywhere a free market lately or in the last 25 years? I haven't. They're all stitched up. Um, but just a serious point, um, I put money into a similar thing to CMIs, um, which is to a thing called Share Energy, which is to uh, fund uh, renewables. And, and I must agree with the comment from Andy that you're sort of slightly short, unsure, you know, where, where's this money going to? And, and to have some, I mean, they do have a very good structure, I should emphasize. And, and you do have, I have confidence in them as people. But that idea about having a, a bit of a stronger structure, which doesn't have to be overburdening, and of course, would be nothing like bank regulation, because that's just nonsense. Um, I think that's a really good idea. Donut economics, you need it. You need it some, we, you know, we've been talking today about reconstructing uh, the economic system within Yorkshire and indeed every, everywhere else. And there's donut economics, there's circular economics, there's uh, universal business income, business, uh, uh, basic income, sorry. All of these things we need to look at and uh, consider and possibly incorporate. But you, you, you have to have some uh, economic model that on the one hand says, look, uh, the biosphere and, and extracting from nature, uh, uh, you know, cannot go on. It has to stop. That's an absolute stop pissing around. Uh, and then on the other hand, and this is political decision, but I think the majority would say you, you've got to have some social um, limitation uh, in terms of just how how you know how far people can fall, or indeed how much you keep them up. Cheers. Thanks, Ed. Stop pissing around. That's that's the slogan we need, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you ever so much to all the speakers. Philip, do you want to just? Um, bring the show to an end well done you've unmuted yeah well i've got the uh, the good job now because uh, first of all i'm going to uh, give a vote of thanks uh, which um first of all to you simon for uh, hosting uh, the three speakers mark from the university of leeds tiffany uh, who's become a close friend uh, from same skies 
Ed has also become a friend uh, from the Independent Constitutionalists UK, where a organisation that have uh, supported us right from the very beginning, and uh, in which we've learnt a lot from. The Festival of Debate for helping organise the event for us, two particular people, uh, Natalie Burton and Joe Chris, and we all, we all hope, Joe, that you're feeling uh, better very soon. Um, one other person I'm going to pick out is uh, Richard Omarati, who uh, is my cohort in, in uh, getting uh, Democratic Yorkshire off the ground. And uh, thank him for his patience in putting up with me as much as he does. Uh, very quickly, uh, next steps. Uh, Tiffany is uh, going to write up the notes or some notes for this evening. And of course, we'll have the video as well. And um, we hope with all three speakers to uh, put that together into a statement uh, on uh, Yorkshire's uh, future economy and how we might move forward. And there might need to be a bit more discussion on that between us uh, as we do that. Um, we are about, of course, developing a constitutional convention and a new constitution for Yorkshire. Process, progress rather, is being made on that. Uh, if you want to go on the website, you'll see a, um, a skeleton uh, which is being set out for that new constitution. And a group of us are moved with, moved, I'm rushing that quick, I can't get my words out. Uh, a meeting early September to look at how we can uh, put all of this together and uh, involve local people in that. Uh, finally, just to give you um, my email address, if you want to be involved in that discussion in September, you're very welcome to join us. And um, the email address to contact me if you're interested is admin at democraticyorkshire.org. That's on the website as well. And finally, yeah. thank you for joining us. And I'm sorry, Simon, I've taken you over three minutes on your deadline. You're forgiven. Well done. And thanks, everyone. Thanks for coping so well with the constraints. Thanks to all of our attendees and for the great questions. And we'll see you again, I hope. Bye for now. Enjoy your evening. Bye.